Welcome back, everyone. Today, I am having a conversation with Jackie about this book, Words of Radiance by Brandon Sanderson, the second installment in the epic Stormlight Archive. We did a buddy read. She agreed to read the novel along with me. I think she's read it several times now, and we're going to have a conversation about it. So, Jackie, uh, I appreciate you joining me. Since you haven't been here before, why don't you let the audience know maybe just a little bit about what you like to read? So thanks for having me on the show. Um, after several years of flirting with fantasy and starting my booktube channel, I uh, came across Brandon Sanderson and the Stormlight Archive. And now like Epic Fantasy and I are in a pretty solid relationship and I'm enjoying where this journey is going. Now, how many times have you actually read this novel? I want to say six. Wow, um, six times. I think that I actually it, sounds like me in the Dark Tower series, but go ahead. I think I read it three times before I did my own review of this because, like, the first two times through, I just like sped read. And then once before the fourth book came out, and then once, probably another time in there, and then once with you. Math is not my strong suit. <laughs> Yeah, you know, this is an incredible series, and, and we're only four books into this thing. Now, of course, I have already purchased the third installment, which is Oathbringer, which is another massive uh, paperback. Mm -hmm. We've got a set of questions here about this book to get us talking, so we're just going to go right ahead with this. I'll take this first question first, and it's which part of the book was your favorite. You know, I thought it was really interesting when Kaladin seemed to be planning on going along with Moash in the plan to kill the king. It really got interesting there for me because I did not see that coming. And of course, I was fooled. I thought that Kaladin was going to go on with the plan. And of course, Sanderson kept him uh, to his morals, and, and uh, he kept him to what Syl suggested that he do, which was to to not kill the king. So I thought that it really started getting dramatic at that point in the novel, uh, kind of towards the end, but I just really liked the drama that played out with the king, and uh, Kaladin's maybe going to kill the king and maybe not, and I just thought that that was probably the most interesting part of the book for me. How about you? What was your favorite part of the novel? Um... I mean, the duel, the four person duel is up there, um, except for I honestly cannot listen to the end of that. I tried on this reread to like listen all the way through and I ended up like running into the other room and singing very loudly as Kellen requested his boon because I just could not. Yeah. Um, but I, I like it when things all come together. So like the duel, even the beginning of that, uh, a new woman, Shalon's chapter, when she comes into camp and Kaladin's like, where are my boots, you thief? And I'm like, those are the yeah. little moments that I just love in this series. Brandon Sanderson really is a genius. You know, I, I have never read him except for The Way of Kings and Words of Radiance. A lot of people are recommending Mistborn and all these other books. It's an, it's incredible what he's doing with this, this massive enterprise, this universe that uh, he's writing in. Have you read the Mistborn novels? I'm curious. I have read, so Mistborn is, right now it's like two series, there's Era 1 and Era 2. <laughs> I have read Era 1, which weren't my favorite, like, it's, a different kind of dark than the Stormlight Archive. And it was like, like it wasn't unexpected. Like it was creative and interesting and like all, all like tech, the technical pieces, but it is earlier Sanderson. So like, I think he finishes what I consider to be the important parts of the story in the epilogue. And I don't like it when an author does that. Um, mm -hmm. But then, like, Era 2, I haven't read because I didn't 
era one wasn't my favorite and it's based off of like cowboys in the old west which is also not my favorite genre but i'm i'm going to read them eventually you know stephen king does something unique and perhaps to an extent that no other author has done it he he has this epic fantasy series the dark tower which isn't quite as extensive as the stormlight's going to be with the with the length of these novels in the stormlight archive but it's an epic tale nonetheless and he also has other books that actually have an influence and very like intimate influence on the series. And it's this huge web of material that all comes back to his epic fantasy, The Dark Tower. Mm -hmm. And it's quite incredible because of that. And, and I just guess this is something that I like about Sanderson because I've never experienced that really outside of Stephen King. And it looks like Sanderson does something very similar to that where the Stormlight Archive will probably be his magnum opus, but then things like Mistborn and some other books have an influence on the events in the series. And it's just very Stephen King-esque with this multiverse kind of feel. Uh, and I just wanted to point that out because, you know, you really have to be a brilliant, great writer to get something like that off. And it really contributes to the experience, you know, because there's just so much involved. A lot of people have told me, here's a question that I have for you. A lot of people have told me that I should stop now and go back and read Warbreaker and Edge Dancer and these other books that give background and depth as far as the Stormlight Archive goes. What would you suggest as far as that whole thing goes? Um, I read, so I, you, I read the books of Way of Kings, Words of Radiance, Oathbringer, back to back, like the first time within a month. Um, wow, it, holy shit. It was the beginning of quarantine and um, I had nothing else to do. Sure. Um, so like that was my that was March, um, and then like when I'm, so I slowed down and actually began to decompress the books, I did go and read Edge Dancer, which does technically fill in a question a person could have at like there is I don't want to spoil anything, but like it does help fill the gap between words of radiance and oathbringer mm. um and that's where it be belongs in the overarching timeline with warbreaker it like it does it didn't really met like what i needed to know from warbreaker or like because i got spoiled what you need to know from warbreaker going into were words of radiance got spoiled for me on reddit um yeah. because i am terrible at having self-control with spoilers um but it's kind of funny going back if you know that information then that kind of spoils part of warbreaker but you yeah. might not even know what it is that you know so you could go back and still be Surprise through Warbreaker. So, so do those novels take place on Roshar, or or is the plot setting somewhere else? They take place in different planets in yeah. uh, Sanderson's extended universe called the Cosmere. Yeah. Um, however, just because they're on different planets does not mean that there's no overlap of cast. That's and interesting. It, That's really and, intriguing. Sanderson has an entire cast of characters called world hoppers that are known for hopping between worlds. Wow. And, Incredible. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 quite incredible, you know. I'm looking forward to all those other books. I know that he writes science fiction and, and a lot of stuff, but let's move on with the uh the second uh question here. You can have this one. Who is your favorite character in Words of Radiance? Uh, I'm In Words of Radiance, I think Shallan wins just because you learn so much about how, like, how hard her life has been. And to see her come from that background and uh, progress across, like, she brings the... Uh, you, 
she brings the deserters together. She frees some slaves and she takes charge of Dalinar's mission into the Shattered Plains and saves everyone it is just it's like this huge, wonderful moment for her. And then she has that moment at the end where she fully remembers her past and it kind of goes downhill from there. But like her overarching theme throughout most of the book was just a really strong story that I really like. And I really like how she handles herself. Yeah, something that's interesting that uh, Sanderson does with this is that the first novel, The Way of Kings, is primarily Kaladin's story, although we're we're with other characters. And, and Words of Radiance is primarily Shallan's story. There are more chapters from her point of view uh, than anyone else's. And I think that Sanderson's done a great job developing her as a personality. You know, she really comes to life in Words of Radiance in a way that she didn't quite in The Way of Kings, I thought. Uh, mm -hmm. So Shallan really uh, is a great character. I like Dalinar quite a bit. You know, I think I think uh, the last book that I read, The Way of Kings, I said that Syl was actually my favorite character because she was very mysterious and I wasn't sure what was going on. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to Oathbringer. I, I understand that, that that's Dalinar, Dalinar's tale. Is that right? Yes, you do get Dalinar's backstory in Oathbringer. Um, I thought how Dalinar handled Amaram and uh, Kaladin's information was, he handled that very poorly. So like Dal Dalinar with this book was on like, I like you, but you're annoying me list. Yeah. Um, yeah, you do, and you do learn a lot more about Dalinar, and it gives, yeah, one, yeah, it gives a whole new perspective on him as a, a more inclusive perspective. Yeah, that's what this book did for Shalon. So I'm really looking forward to Dalinar. I'm curious. I, I don't know for the fourth book, uh, Rhythm of War. Is mm -hmm. that what perspective is? Is that one? Is that whose book is that? Um, so it's. Venley's, you just met Venley as the annoying evil sister to Eshenai, the Parshendi shard bearer in the uh, interludes of this book. Yeah. And how much can I say? Um, in some cases, like I really feel like her story go like flows more naturally as like a sequel to Words of Radiance than is to Oathbringer um, because Dalinar's perspective is very much like at the end of Words of Radiance, he's defeated the Parshendi. He's going up to new levels, literally uh, sw swearing radiant ideals. Um, and he's just like done with the Parshendi. And then with Rhythm of War, it's like, oh, remember these people that we haven't really seen for a few for a full book? Uh, they're important again. Or interesting. So it's a I it's an interesting way of moving forward. I thought that that one would have to be to do it dealing with the Parshendi because rhythm of war would be one of the like vocal patterns, the rhythm, the rhythms that they, uh, that they chant to and that they sing to. But, you know, I'm really uh, looking forward to moving on uh, with this series. I would say that maybe Dalinar was my favorite character. He did seem to be a bit frustrating after all that Kaladin had done for him. He, mm -hmm. he didn't take his word about the Amaram thing. He thought that he was just making that shit up, which didn't, and I'm sure Sanderson wrote it like that intentionally to try mm -hmm. to build maybe a little bit of animosity in the reader against Dalinar with that whole thing. But uh, he did actually make that right when he called Amaram over and confronted mm -hmm. him in front of Kaladin later on. So he 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 managed to get some justice uh, against himself there. But I liked Dalinar and I'm really looking forward to the next book. Let's go on to the next one. How did this novel compare to The Way of Kings? Did you like it better or was it not as good for you? I kind of think it's, I think uh, to be totally honest, Words of Radiance is probably written 
better. It's a more streamlined story. It is like, it has direction and like, there's a sense of, it's all like, it's all the, the finale is going to happen. Stuff, stuff is going to get real at the end and it's like a hundred days or whatever the countdown begins at. And once you have that time, that like that, that timer going and things keep happening and it gets more and more intense. It's a really, I love how that crafts the story to give it a sense of impending doom where, whereas the, the way of Kings was like, Oh, we're, we're at this strange new land and now we're going to explore a bit and something's going to happen. We don't know what, there's things happening um, and there's probably going to be a final battle, but there's not really a promise of it until suddenly it's like, boom, the bridges are gone. Dalinar is stranded and Kaladin has a moral decision. It's like, oh my gosh. But there wasn't like the prom there, like there was the promise that Kaladin was going to, at least I thought that Kaladin was going to save Dalinar at some level but I never got like, I didn't, that didn't come together for me until the end of part two at the way of King, in the way of Kings. Um, so I think the structure was better in words of radiance. However, uh, Calden was mean to Syl for most of words of radiance, which I did not like. Dalinar yeah. was a terrible boss and I didn't like that, but Shalon was great. Whereas in the way of Kings, all those character interactions, I like them in their own ways. So I like Way of Kings more, but Words of Radiance is probably better written. Yeah, you know, uh, I guess I'll get into maybe something that I wasn't as big a fan of in this book. You know, the, I thought that the Way of Kings was good all the way through. I thought that it ended well and everything. With And then what I thought was going to happen after I finished the Way of Kings I thought, okay, this is going to be a 10 book series and two five book blocks. So that, so the first story should come to an end at the end of the fifth book. So I'm seeing this play out and I thought it was going to be one big build up to fighting the Parshendi. And then at the end of the second book, that's already been resolved now, at least to some degree. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm thinking, well, what's going to happen next with this? Because this came to a conclusion a lot faster than I expected. I expected this huge build up to a world war and it didn't go the way that I thought. So I just wasn't sure what I thought of that ending. And, and you know a lot more about this than I do because you've read uh, the third and fourth installments, but I guess I was just flabbergasted by the way that it ended. I did not see that coming. And I really liked the novel, you know, I've had a, a problem with epic fantasy in the past where I stop reading on the second installment. You know, I usually like the first installment in an epic fantasy, and then the second one can kind of feel like a rollover of the first book again with the same characters going toward a similar task, and I just fall off on it. I'm not into it. But this one kept me going, and I'm looking forward to the third installment. Uh, however, uh, based on the ending of the book, I would say that that maybe, of course, Shalon comes to life in the second installment. So there were a lot of things about Words of Radiance that perhaps were better than The Way of Kings. But in conclusion, I think that I actually probably would give The Way of Kings a slight edge on which book I thought uh, was better. And that may change when I read the next one. So. Let's go on with the next question. Words of Radiance is told from four primary perspectives. Shalon, Kaladin, Dalinar, and Adolin in this one. If you could have perspective from any other character, who would you choose and why? I'll take this one. You know, I would really like to see the perspective. Well, it would be interesting to see it from the Parshendi's point of view, and I'll get to that in the fourth installment of the series, but... I would like to see it from Sill's perspective or, or perhaps Pattern's perspective because I think it would be a really different take on what's going on. I'm, I'm really curious about these, the spren and what they mean. They're, they're apparently elements of nature that have become cognitive somehow. Um, and there's a lot of mystery there. And I like the character Sill a lot. I thought it was interesting that she abandoned Kaladin 
at some point in Words of Radiance. I thought that that was a good idea by Sanderson, uh, but I would like to see it from Sill's side of the story. How about you? Um, I kind of want, would like more of like one of the members of Bridge Four, kind of, mm. because we get a sense, and we do have like a half, half a chapter, I think, but because we see like the Bridgemen come into Dalinar's camp and we see it all from Kaladin's perspective and Kaladin is just having a miserable time, even though like things are going well as still like, Syl's another good one. Like if you hadn't said Syl, I probably would have taken her, but um, we don't really get to see like what Kaladin's success looks like when he is the captain of Dalinar's guards and is finally in a in a leadership role and being recognized for it. And I felt like there was this promise in the way of Kings where like Calden is trying to figure out the best way to do a bridge run and get strung up for it. And then another chapter Dalinar is like, you always commend your officers when they try to improve and you're like oh it'll be so great when dalinar is commending Kaladin for being a good officer and we never really get to see that because like Kaladin is just always so down on himself and oh and we don't get and i think that like a member of bridge four like lopin when who helps Kaladin would be able to see like oh the boss is doing great today and things are going well and to get like that, yeah. that place, that high at the beginning, which would then make Kaladin's dropping lower, go even lower. You know, it would be interesting to see the story from Rock's tail. You know, I think that would be, would be a lot of fun. He's an interesting character. I think he's probably, one of the most beloved characters, one of the most beloved minor characters. Uh, you know, I really like his personality. And it's kind of it's kind of ironic because he's probably the biggest, toughest guy of them all, but he he won't fight. And I'm curious, I'm curious, and you probably already know. I want to know if he's gonna kill somebody in this story. I want to know if he's gonna fight, but uh perhaps I'll I'll figure that out when I move on uh with the later installments. But I agree that, that it would be interesting. I actually want to get a Bridge 4 t-shirt or something. I've got to get something to do with this series. You know, I never thought that I would be pulled into something like the Dark Tower series again. And this is really great. You know, I like a long story with tons of background and scope and depth. But one where the author manages to not always focus on world building and actually keep the ball rolling. And that's one of the things that I really give... Sanderson a lot of credit for with this is that it's been unusual for me in the way of epic fantasy for it to kind of have a suspenseful nature. A lot of sometimes it can lack in epic fantasy, a suspenseful plot, but I think that Sanderson really manages to keep it interesting, uh, especially over these huge volumes. I think he does really good with that. Let's go on to the next one. You can have this one. How did the four main characters change throughout the novel? So, I mean, we have Kaladin, Shalon, and Dalnar are all swearing new ideals by the end and coming into more of an idea of what it, what it means to be a good, what it means to be in a complete cliche way, like the best version of themselves or like the the idealized version of themselves. And I like that about each of them and how they each come to it their own way. Um, and Adolin, does, we're counting Adolin as the fourth main character, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Adolin does not, um, but he does learn something new about himself and that he is, not the perfect boy he always thinks he is, but he also learns um, who his true friends are. And I, yeah, I feel like Adolin's arc is the most unfinished of 
the of the characters, uh, probably because he doesn't have a radiant spren to uh, show us in clear blinding lights. Like this is character development. Um, yeah. But uh, with yeah, with all those, I think that they they all do make progress towards becoming better people, which is nice to see with he epic fantasy heroes. You know, in the first one, Kaladin really comes a long way in the way of Kings. He goes from being an incarcerated slave to the captain of an army. And for Dark Eyes, that was almost like unfathomable progress that he made in the first novel. And it's interesting now because he's he's become powerful. We're going to talk about if he's too powerful here shortly. But he really comes a long way in his capabilities. Of course, he defeats Zeth in this one. And we might as well stop here and address this this issue. There's a difference between yeah. the paperback and the audiobook. I I was listening to the audiobook and reading the paperback simultaneously and they're very very close throughout some different word changes and and whatnot, but but it wasn't a problem for me. And then when it comes to the battle with Zeth, it changes. I think it's in the audiobook that Zeth is actually killed by Kaladin. Mm -hmm. And in the paperback He's not killed by Kaladin. You want to give us your thoughts on that? Well, as soon as you told me back in the beginning that you were doing both the, the paperback and the audiobook, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to hear what he has to say about this. Um, because I had read it like twice and bought the hard the hardcover. Um, and he Kaladin kills Zeth in the hardcover as well. Yeah. Uh and so I, once again, just on the internet somewhere, someone's like, oh, Callan doesn't kill Zeth at the end of Words of Radiance. And I was, what? Right. Um, and I had to go back and search that. And I, like, I did read and I sent you Sanderson's thoughts that, like, Callan isn't a killer which like on the one hand makes me respect Kaladin more for his like his, him wanting to balance protection of others with like pro <laughs> with protecting the lives of the people he is trying to defeat, <laughs> which generally yeah. means kill, but not always. However, there's also that concern of like, okay, um, you do realize that most people consider it morally acceptable to kill someone who is actively trying to kill you yeah. and just worried about like the, if Kaladin was like taking it too far and if that was, I guess, healthy for him. And so just so I have this straight, the way that it was originally published was that Kaladin had killed him and then Ch Sanderson changed it. Is that right? Yes. It's like, it's the new edition of the paperback. Uh, that, and I like when, if you like going back and listening to the fight scene, it's very clear to me, at least with hindsight that like, Ka like he's, I think he stresses that like Kaladin was just doing a testing blow and didn't realize that, Zeth wasn't going to parry. Um, and so he yes. was really trying to write it that like Kaladin wasn't intending to kill Zeth. It just sort of happened. Yeah. Um, as opposed So that is it, his intentions were good, but he still killed the guy, but then he changed it. Yeah, but then he changed, but then Sanderson went, oh no, that even that's too dark for <laughs> Kaladin. Kaladin. Kaladin needs to be, have like be truly the knight in shining armor, but he doesn't have armor, um, and not kill Zeth in this moment. And I can res like I can respect that, but also with how this came about, I'm very curious as to like how many fans out there still think that Kaladin killed Zeth because. Not every people, I'm, I'm learning that not everyone is obsessed with this book series and not everyone does all the research that I do. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad that I caught that. Uh, 
I'm, I'm glad that I that I use both of those mediums so that I'm I know where it stands with it. Officially speaking, he doesn't kill him, which is uh, pretty interesting. That's pretty interesting. Uh, let's move on. Actually, I've got to finish answering that last question. How did the the four main characters change? So Kaladin comes to be closer with Dalinar and more trusted by Dalinar, which I think that is interesting. And Shallan has evolved a long way. She's come mm -hmm. a long way. And you know what's interesting? She's kind of become Yasna in some ways, is what I'm seeing, because she she's now taken over Yasna's life quest basically she's taken over her mission and she's become kind of like a substitute for yasna with navani now uh mm -hmm. at the end of words of radiance so she really just like takes yasna's place and it surprised me uh when yasna was murdered as well but shallan's come a long way and now she she knows she's a radiant and kaladin knows he's a radiant and dalinar knows that he's one as well which uh, is kind of surprising. Now I'm really interested for Oathbringer because uh, Dalinar is inhaling the stormlight from one of the gems um, at the end of the book. And Adolin, uh, like you said, he doesn't seem like he's evolved a, a real long way. You know, I like Adolin um, because he's very like Dalinar, right? He has at least some respect for the codes. Oh, you know what's an interesting fact, and I'm sure you already realize this, but I like the way that Brandon Sanderson titled The Way of Kings for his novel, and it was a book within the book. The Way of Kings was their holy book, and Words of Radiance was the name of a book in the book, which I thought uh, was pretty interesting. Uh, as far as Adolin goes, you know, I really like his character. Um, he um, He's maybe gotten some respect, by the way, because he did actually beat the four shard bearers, which was unexpected, but... Um, plus he's actually stepped up and saved the king from assassination after he was in on the assassination. So he's perhaps become much closer to both Dalinar and the king, which will have to play into his favor, uh, in some way. But, uh, there was a lot of evolution, uh, of the characters. Of course, you can evolve a lot over 1,310 pages, but I'm interested to see, uh, how it continues on in the next one. Let's go with the next question here. How is the Stormlight series different from other epic fantasy that you've read? You can take this one. Well, I'm basically I've read the 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 Lord of the Rings as like the premier epic fantasy, and I'm just starting now on the Wheel of Time, mm. um, and in between the two, I think that. Like the Stormlight, as you say, is very like does have the a very good balance between having plot driven forward and still building the world, which both um, Tolkien and Jordan are kind of known for not having a good balance of the two. At least, I mean, like I love world building, and I will. I think I like. I think some of my par favorite parts of the Lord of the Rings are actually in the appendixes. Um, but having this experience of having relatable characters in an intriguing plot in a fantasy world and all, all in the same story is like, oh, this is something new that I'm really excited about in the Stormlight Archive that I haven't really come across anywhere else, but I haven't read that many. I did try to read the King Killer Chronicle and The Witcher, and well, the King Killer Chronicle. I the they were believe well, it was believable how unbelievable the character was. Um, just a guy telling a tall tale, and I didn't yeah. think it was that interesting. But uh, it's it's just got like everything I was looking for in a good story, and it just keeps coming. Maybe you can tell me what's going on with this because Sanderson has says that he wants to do the first part of the story in five books, and then there will be a second part of the story in another five books. Has he has he forecasted at all if like the characters from the first set are going to show up in the second set, or or, or do you know anything about that? Um. He has been very aloof. In, okay, 
he's been clear in that it's like a 15 year gap and that mm. the focus like each book has a focus character and that the five we've met the five focus characters who will be the focus characters of the back five i think they're like renarin yasna tom ash lift you might um and you have met all of them at this point i don't know if you know that you've met all of them at this point yeah um and so like their background characters and the they've been very uh non-specific on of the main four of this series being Cal and Dalinar, Shalon and Adolin. He says that those who survive will show up again in the back five, but it's unclear as to how much of a role they will play, if any. And if they survive, of course. Right. And that's more terrifying. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I guess it just kind of disgruntled me because I was hoping it would be 10 long books of the same story all the way through. You know, that's what I wanted. And then I thought, no, it's only going to be a five book story. That's going to cut the epic nature of it in half. Um, but, but he's a genius with this kind of shit. So we'll have to see what he comes up with. You know, things evolve and they change and they get better over time as we humans work with things. And that is true of literature as well. Uh, modern authors have taken the storytelling art to another level. And many believe that Sanderson is actually the best fantasy writer, that he's the pinnacle of fantasy writing uh, because he's just so involved with reading many different books and learning from Robert Jordan and J.R.R. Tolkien and everything. So perhaps that's why this series is as good as it is. And you know, the books are among the absolute highest rated on Goodreads. They're, they've got astronomical Goodreads rating. I think Words of Radiance is like 4.75 or something like that, which means that almost every damn person that reads it gives it a perfect rating. It could be that he's just become the best uh, at it, period. So, uh, mm -hmm. and, and like you, I haven't read a ton of fantasy. I haven't read the, all the Game of Thrones books. I've only read one. That's a series that I burned out on in the second book. I haven't read past the first book in the Malazan series, which many people think that one's the greatest of all time. But, um, you know, Sanderson just is a really, really good author. Let me, uh, let me uh, answer that question really quickly. How is it different from other epic fantasy that I've read? I've probably read fewer epic fantasy novels than you have. Of course, I have completed the Dark Tower series, which is a lower end fantasy, um, which kind of takes it away from the sword and sorcery kind of thing. It's not that. It's part Western, part story that takes place in our world in New York City. So it's a, it's a different kind of story. Um, so it's way different than that. But, uh, you know, there are some common tropes that are, are found in the Stormlight Archive, like Warring Kings. That's a very common one. That's in uh, uh, the Game of Thrones books. But um, how it differs is, is just probably in how damn good of a writer Brandon Sanderson is. It's re it really surprised me that I not only finished the second novel, but that I was completely engrossed in the second novel. And at no time did I feel like I was having to push through that thing. Uh, yeah, so let's move on to the next one. This is a pretty interesting question, and I actually wrote a lot of notes about this as I was going, and I'll let you take this one. What do you make of Shallan's relationship with her brothers? I, I think that you probably, I really like that she's the youngest and that she's the one that has to uh, be the strongest. I think like I know that there's conversations about the trope of being like the girl with four brothers and how she's when she's the when you're the girl with four brothers, you are also like the tomboy character and you're tough but in a very masculine way. But Shalon is very feminine and and that's and comes off as meek and uh, so so sweet and innocent and then like you get to know her and you're like oh my gosh you are a strong and b also somewhat terrifying um you've killed both of your parents and 
that is oh and you did the right thing when doing that and all that that she was able to go through all of that and like hold her family together as best she could is I think really inspiring um, but I don't I don't feel necessarily like I have a good hold on like because like her her brother's her relationship with with her brothers was something that was very important to her in the flashbacks but because right. it's not something that is in her present timeline there's that sort of disconnect for me at least of feeling like okay that was something that was important but it's not something that is currently important yeah Something that's interesting about Shalon's relationship with her brothers, and I just pulled up my notes here. She has a brother named Balat, and she actually prevented him, in my eyes, from becoming a serial killer because one of the, the common traits among serial killers is they like to, to torture animals, right? And Balat had that trait pretty significantly where he would pick the, the arms off the little crabs or whatever was going on. So he was like on this negative trajectory that she managed to deflect him uh, in a different way. So she saved him in my eyes in that way. Uh, with Kim, she prevents from committing suicide. So she saved two of her brothers with that. And she also saved the life potentially of her brother Jushu when she went out to trade the shoes and the watch or whatever it was that she traded uh, with his, um, with the people that had taken him prisoner. So she, in some way, saved all three of her brothers and she's still out trying to save them. She actually went on an epic quest that would seem almost impossible to achieve to steal someone's soul caster, to try to get them out of trouble uh, and herself out of trouble because she was probably somewhat responsible for trying to replace the soul caster herself as she was a part of that family. But she's even now working on getting her brothers to come in uh, so that she can get protection for them. Uh, so it's just really um, interesting that she's taken basically her entire life mission is to save her brothers. And that's how it was when she was little. She was actively working toward somehow making a better life for her brothers. Uh, so I just thought that that was really interesting. Any Anything more you want to say on that one? I do. And I, I do. It does strike me as odd that like the one brother who was able to get out and was the one that died. Um, yeah. At Calvin's hands. Um, but how like her her eldest brother, Helleran, who she lists as like her inspiration, but is also in the interesting position of he didn't save them, he left them. Um, and in trying to be in, in not being where he was needed for his family, it actually put the entire world in jeopardy um, or all these crazy things into motion. Um, and so like how, yeah, the scene, scene like th thinking of like, what if he and Shalon, like what if Hellebrand had stayed and what if he and Shalon could have worked together? Mm. And like those, those kinds of questions, I kind of like to ponder. Uh, and also just considering how the different approaches were to saving the family that Halloran was going to leave and then come back the hero and didn't. And Shalon stayed and actually got the job done to a certain extent. And then she left. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. And here's something that, uh, that I know you'll want to say something about. I thought that Sanderson did a great job when it came to Shalon's father, because I actually had some sympathy for him once I saw the truth about how his wife died, you know, and then and he was kind of trying to cover that up to protect Shalon over the years. So so maybe he was bad, but perhaps he wasn't all bad. What do you think as far as uh, that part of the story went? I I really think it's interesting how like Shalon felt more guilty about killing her mother than about killing her father because I do think that like her mother like Shalon was what like eight I think when her mother yeah. attacked her and on instinct Shalon 
summoned her shard blade and killed her. And yeah. like where and like that was like not premeditated, heat of the moment self-defense. And then you get to Shalon's father, who has been trying in his very flawed way to keep the family together. Yeah. Even if he has to kill them all to do it, which is bad. Um, and then like you see her, she goes like before she goes downstairs to see what's happened, she goes upstairs to get the poison. And then she comes downstairs, sees what happens, serves him the poison. When that doesn't work, then she strangles him. And like yeah. there's <laughs> like premeditation, carry out, and mega follow through that is like so much more of like a the like it was defense i think i think it is defense of others and that like her stepmother had already been killed he was beating her other brother but like that she feels less guilty over that mind is mind boggling to me you know you don't see that part of her in the way of kings um because she seems like she's just this timid girl that's trying to just steal something and, and she doesn't have a whole lot of backbone but words of radiance really uh, shows us a different side of shalom let's move on to the next one here what do you make of the king oh elakar i do not he's so pathetic <laughs> and you just like He's like top of the list of characters I want to slap in this book. Um, just like, just grow up or he's not a good king. And like that he can neither be a figurehead with grace because he or take command and that he's just everywhere and spiteful to boot. It's like, I don't like him. But I also think that he, I think that he is trying. He's just very bad at succeeding. <laughs> yeah. I really like the audio book narrator's voice for him. Did you uh, like that? It was like this squeaky, irritating uh, voice. But, uh, you know, the, the king would be doomed without Dalinar's direction. He would have never made it very long. He would have been killed by somebody or he would have somehow ruined everything. It's mm -hmm. been Dalinar that has held things together. And, and I'm sure that you already know this, but I really am interested in if Dalinar takes over the kingship and I expect that he will at some point. But, uh, you know, when it comes to the king, I think that Anytime an author writes a character that gets an emotional response from the reader, uh, it's an ace in my book. And Elokar is someone that it's very easy to be just upset with as the reader. Because he's in a position where if he would just use a little sense that he mm -hmm. could actually work some things out, but he's totally incapable of it. Uh, and, you know, I really want to see Dalinar take the throne. I, I'm interested in that, but we'll move on. Uh, with the next question, because I haven't read the rest of the books yet. What do you think? Is Kalanin and Shalon and perhaps Dalin are now too powerful? One of the things that I see, and it, it happens in the Dresden Files sometimes, which is a low-end fantasy series that I'm currently reading, seems like Harry Dresden can just pull out the magic wand at the last moment, and bang, he's out of the horrible situation. And I'm not big on that kind of stuff. So so actually, Kaladin comes in in this one like he's Superman, flying in and everything. Mm -hmm. Are the characters too powerful, or how do you feel about that whole thing? Um, I think that one of the things that Sanderson does well is that, yes, like the, the next ideal is always going to provide the power-up that the characters desperately need to save the day, probably. Um, it's, but there's always like the matter of, are they going to get to it in time? Um, and like, it's not, and yeah, there's always like, will they, will they mature enough to reach this goal in time to save the day or will they not do it? And I think, but on the other hand, I think down that Sanderson does make it very clear 
that these are well-defined power levels that like it's like you know going in that like Zeth can fly and he well he, he can't heal. Um Zeth can fly and summon the shard blade and Kaladin's powers once he grows he'll be able to fly and summon a shard blade probably. Um like cuz and so there's like the expectation that like it like when Kaladin summons Sil the first time as a shard blade it's like a big oh my goodness moment but it's not like completely like, where did that power come from? It's not like he's pulling it out of thin air. It's like, oh, that was actually foreshadowed and explained in advance, which makes it better. But I also think yeah. that Sanderson does a very good job of leveling up the competition. Like, now that Kaladin can fly and summon the Shard Blade, and if you pointed him at Parshendi, like, they would just be doomed. So now the enemy isn't the Parshendi, it's the new forms coming awake in the Everstorm, whatever those are. Yeah. And so there's a leveling up, but I think he, Sanderson keeps it. The bad guys are always like got another, the good guys do something and win for right now, but then they always level up one more after that. Um, you know, I did feel like they were maybe a little bit too powerful. I like it when, when there's, there's powers involved, but somehow when it comes to the resolution, they manage to resolve things in such a way that don't require the powers. You know, that's, that's the ideal situation for me as a reader, but, um, you know, I just can't imagine that anything could stop them now because Kaladin is probably like, 80% of the way to understanding how to be as strong as he can. And Shallan's come a long way being powerful and she's got her own blade. And now Dalinar is going to be basically invincible. Um, so, and now even members of the bridge four have some minor capabilities with the stormlight. Lopin is trying to figure out how to make that uh, gem, the light from that. And then finally he gets it toward the end of the novel. So mm -hmm. I just can't imagine what Sanderson's going to produce that threatens that. And I don't want to, I don't want to doubt him because he's really surprised me with these first two books. Um, so I don't know, I guess, like you said, it'll just depend on how, how the forces for evil evolve. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, we'll leave that one there. What are the main points you think the author is trying to make? I guess I'll take this one. And the, just the one thing that, that stands out to me is Kaladin considers going to kill the king in this one. He's been convinced by everyone. The king keeps messing up and he comes to... And even I as the reader was thinking, that's what needs to happen. Kill the king, you know? Um, and, and I think maybe the point that, that he was making there, because Syl, who seems to be the ultimate understanding of what is right and wrong separates from the scenario because Kaladin's going in what she perceives to be the wrong direction. So maybe the author was trying to make the point that you should stick with your moral understanding of a situation, even if it seems that the easy way out would be preferable. Maybe I've got that wrong. I'm not really sure, but he, he was making some kind of point there where Kaladin realized he had it wrong. And he, he changed at the last minute and managed to rectify the problem. Um, so there was some kind of lesson in there uh, that I saw, but uh, that's about all I'm coming up with. What do you think about this one? What was Sanderson trying to tell us with this book? Well, there's like half of me that thinks of Sanderson as like wit who hates it when people try to read meanings into his moralistic stories. And of course, wit <laughs> stories always have a moral. But you're not supposed to read them into it. Um, but on the other hand, I Sanderson's stories kind of do have morals, and that's one, especially the Stormlight Archive, and that's one of the things I like about it. And it is for me like Calvin's journey and Shalon's journey too to like recognize, I always say, like the lies that they're telling themselves. Like Calvin was trying to convince himself that it would be okay to kill the king. Because his, his gut reaction was, no, that's wrong. And then, yeah. like, 
storming Moash talks him into it. And, um, and then Shalon has other is, has other lies like that she keeps on denying that she killed her mother and that she had a shard blade and that she comes to the realization that she does have the power. Um, it's interesting because she knows she's not weak, but she doesn't want to own up to like her strengths because she sees them as dangerous. And both of them coming to that realization during this book um, and to use their powers for good is, I think, like to is the message that Sander that I'm getting from Sanderson that you can be powerful and even have dead like even have deadly strength, but if you can use it in a line with your moral code and listen to what is true you'll be okay. You know, something else that's coming to me with this is that perhaps perseverance is a message because in the first book, Bridge 4 is just basically expected to die in short order, but they they still manage to set goals for themselves with the leadership of Cal. And it reminds me of this nonfiction book I read called, um, the hell was the name of the thing? Uh, let me look at that. Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. It's one part concentration camp survivor's memoir. One part about goals, where this guy actually found meaning for himself and set goals while he was in Auschwitz waiting to be executed. It was about goal setting in the, in the, in the worst possible scenarios, still trying to grow in those areas. And, and that has happened with Bridge 4. And... And Kaladin went from expected to die to captain uh, of a guard as a dark eyes. Just with perseverance alone, he managed to make it happen. And then in the second book, he went from captain to now being basically a superhero with just perseverance. So uh, I guess I uh, thought that I would put that in there. And another point here on, on Sanderson. Actually, let's go to the next question because it fits with this. What did you make of the author's writing style? Sanderson seems to be extremely knowledgeable, um, shoot, about life. And one of the things that I liked in the book was that he really makes these points about life. And he seems to be a very philosophical person that understands what life's about. And he understands how societies work and how relationships work and how motive works and how psychology works. And I just kept seeing that coming up over and over again uh, in it, where he seems like he's a very well considered person, and I and that shows in his writing style because um, he keeps like bringing these things up that make me want to just stop for a minute and consider on the point that he made about reality and life and everything. Uh, and I really liked that. I thought that it was good. I think that he's a really smart guy. That under really, he's like a, he's one of the type of people you might want to go to if you had a real fucked up problem and you needed advice on something real serious. Yeah, you know what I mean. Where he would give you his insight. He's that type of person, I think. But anyway, what did you think of the author's writing style? Oh, I like how it balances because yes, he hits the philosophical the insightful into personality all those like all the deep stuff like he gets there but it also has like I don't know, it has poop jokes um and it levels out and there's like one of the things that like I was actively looking for and never thought I would find was like the a book that perfectly balances uh, Socratic dialogue with poop jokes. Like that was something I was actively looking for in my life. Um, and Sanderson has that. And that's something that I really appreciate because like, it is one of the other weird things about life that before you can sit down to have like the, this is my life's drama, like conversation with a person you need to spend like for every like one hour of serious conversation. I think you need to spend like five of them of just like 
hanging out, doing normal people stuff, uh, going to the wine house and just hanging and just acting like normal people do before you go, but before you can really, you have to build the relationship before you can rely on the relationship. And I think Sanderson does a great job of having both parts of human interaction. And it's not just silly all the time. And it's not just drum all the time. It is both. Yeah, he does a really good job. You know, from what I understand, the Stormlight Archive is him at his best as an author that's had a lot of experience at that point. So I don't know what it would be like reading Mistborn or some of these books that he wrote years ago. But, um, you know, he just seems to be a very wise person is what I'm getting at with his writing style. You know, actually it reminds me kind of like Dean Koontz because Dean Koontz is an author where I've read several books by him that I like, but I've read a whole lot more that I thought were just flops, just flops big time. But I still find value in his books because he's so insightful about things that it's almost like I can circle whole paragraphs from Dean Koontz that have so much value as far as the insight go. Um, yeah, but uh, Sanderson is definitely uh, a good writer. I, I really like uh, I really like his books. What is a spren? Can you explain this to me? Because I don't think I have it 100% yet. Um. I think you're going to find out a lot more in the book. <laughs> okay. But I think how Syl puts it in this book is the personific is the personification of what people perceive as honor. And she is a small bit of honor who is a God, uh, well, is a God of this world, little G God, um, and how the, how the, how those little gods interact with the planets create physical manifestations. And some of those things are living things. And some of those are spread. I don't know if that, if that explanation made more or less sense to you. Um, it, it's interesting. And, and I'm looking forward because, because I got a better explanation in the second installment of the series than I got in the first. So I, I'm interested in what I'll learn about Spren in Oathbreaker. Um, and, and we may not really understand everything until the 10th and final installment of the series, you know, yeah. um, Sanderson's a really prolific guy. And, and you said that the next book is projected for 2023. So, uh, you know, I have some time to get the next two in, but I, I really uh, am interested in seeing how he continues to develop uh, the supernatural type entities uh, in the story. We've got time for a few more here. Let's talk about this for a moment, just briefly. How is an epic fantasy series different than a single a double or even a trilogy. You want to give us your thoughts on that? Um, my take on it so far has been that not so much, it's not so much like what's happening. Like I think that if you took the Stormlight Archive, at least probably the front five, and only wrote it from Kaladin's perspective, mm. it would probably come across as like a trilogy. Yeah. Um, like with Words of Radiance being the end of the first book and Rhythm of War being the end of the second book and the fifth book, yeah. the third book. Um, I think, or yeah, it would come across that way if you just took all the other parts out. And what makes epic fantasy, epic fantasy, and um, like the, what gives these books such length is that you get, Calvin and Adolin and Shalon and Dan like you have four main characters and then you have the interludes and then you have like the random one-off chapters that just make this could what could be a very narrow story such breath that it just takes because I, I think um like I, I think Words of Radiance takes place over three months, which is like the same length of time a Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants book takes. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't get in it and you have that also has four main characters, but 
you don't get interludes in that and you don't get like, you don't need to build the world because that's set in the real world, theoretically. Um, and I think that's the main difference between like the, the Lord of the Rings. Yes, it has the multiple characters, but you're really only getting it from two viewpoints and that's what stresses out into a trilogy or one very long book, depending on who you ask. Yeah. There's a lot of different characters in an epic and with an epic, you get so much background and so much sense of scope and things happen like over generations, a lot of times in an epic where there'll be a character and then that character's mother and then their grandmother. And, and, and you just get this sense of like, just this massive sense of hugeness with this thing. And it's a reading experience that you just cannot get if you're just reading a standard size novel, you know? And I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting reading experience to read a lengthy series like that. And, and I don't mean something like uh, the Alex Cross, James Patterson type books where it's the same character, but each book is a different plot, even though the character is evolving. In an epic, it's like just one story straight through, and you get so many different relationships and places and everything that it just becomes this huge world, and you just can't quite do that with like uh, even a trilogy, you know. So mm -hmm. I, I just think that it's a really interesting and unique reading experience is an epic. What did you think of the audiobook narrators? I love Michael Kramer's voice. Um, like, I honestly think that his his reading of it has get, given me new appreciation for male protagonists. Like, that's something that I've come to realize just going back over what I used to like in books and what I now like in books. Um, I'm also discovering how mildly dyslexic I've been my entire life and how much stuff I've like just completely missed in books. Um, that's just audiobooks in general. Um, like when I go back to listen to audiobooks of books I've read myself and first and be like, oh, that's a scene in this book. I had no idea. Um, yeah. I think Michael Kramer does a great job. Kate Redding is his wife and is a wonderful woman. She always sound she always kind of sounds more mature than I think Shalon is. Uh, is it a husband and wife duo that did the audiobook? Yeah. Ah, interesting. I didn't realize. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think Kate Redding does a great like Navani voice. Like her Navani is like exactly how I imagine Navani. But I always think that she's comes off as sounding like too mature to be like it's easy to forget when she reads Shalon that Shalon is 17 I think when the book is happening um wow okay interesting and that gives it a different spin um but I don't it's not that she's doing a bad job it's just how her voice sounds you know I uh I've just recently started getting into narrating uh, and I was narrating a poem and it can be a challenge when you've got, got to change voices and whatnot. That can be a real challenge. Some people are just great at it. You know, a lot of comedians can do like 50 different voices, but uh, it seems to me that it's hard to even do just more than like a couple. Uh, and I, I, I will, I think I'm agreeing with you when I say that uh, the male narrator has a really good voice for it. And I would say he was probably the stronger of the two narrators. The The female voice was fine. The lady that did uh, the female perspective, I thought it was okay. But that guy's voice really seems to be just good for an audiobook. It has kind of like this rumbling sound to it a little bit. But, um, you know, I, I'm someone that has now been basically ad addicted to listening to the narration while I follow the text simultaneously. And the reason is that if I listen to the audiobook only, it can be okay, but I won't absorb as much. And I, and I think you were saying that like you can miss stuff. You can miss stuff like that. It just doesn't, it's not as vivid in my mind when I listen to the audio narration only. I can do it, uh, but if I just follow along with the text, it 
brings it to life all the way. Um, and it seems like it's less brain power for me if I'm listening to the audiobook. I don't really have to put any effort into reading it. It's just going, <laughs> going, going. Um, but I think that the narrators are pretty good for this series. Uh, and I'm glad about uh, that. I think the guy does quite a good job, quite a good job switching the different voices and stuff. It all works out uh, very well. We have time for one final question. And I'm going to let you get the very last word on this. Uh, so I'll take the question first. What did you think about the ending? Were you satisfied with the ending? And here's my take on the ending. And I mentioned it briefly earlier that this played out differently than I expected. I expected that this, the whole five books in the first half of this series would be one big buildup to the battle with the Parshendi. And that's over already. So I'm like, well, I don't know if this is good or bad because I, I do in some sense know what's coming next because um, the entities were reawakened. I can't remember what the name of those are. So there is another enemy on the horizon that's supposedly going to be powerful and all this stuff. And I fear, I fear that what's going to happen is we're going to recycle this and it's going to be kind of like another battle with the Parshendi again, where there was one battle with the Parshendi after the first two books and maybe after the, the next couple, there'll be another battle that's similar. I just don't want to see a recycle on the idea. So I'm in fear that that's going to happen with this. Um, but maybe that's not the case and you have a better idea of what's going to happen in that fifth book than I do, but um, it surprised me. I'm just uncertain how I feel about the ending with this one. So I'll let you take us out here. What did you think about the ending in this book? I mean, probably one of the reasons why I have a hard time knowing how many times I've read this book is because every time I get a headache, I turn on Swallowed by the Sky, and like that keeps me until the elite, until the Tylenol kicks in. Like, that is just like my headache cure for everything. And I just love that chapter, which is the one that Calvin swoops in at the end. And it's just mm -hmm. ah, wonderful. Um, <laughs> after that, um, like I do, I am, I am really bummed that like him and Adolin didn't get another scene together because like, I think Kaladin tells Shalon to tell Adolin that Kaladin thinks Adolin's okay. And then Adolin tells Dalinar that he's fine with Kaladin being a Knight Radiant. But they never, like, talk to each other. And I think the last time they talked to each other, Kaladin is insulting Adolin and is being a jerk. So I always felt like that wasn't resolved. But I also understand that that couldn't be resolved for Adolin to be in the headspace to knife Sadius in the eye, um, which had which apparently had to happen. Um, and like, I almost consider like the battle on the plains to be like the end of Words of Radiance, and then like everything from the Britons onward is the beginning of Oathbringer. Like it it opens up so many new worms for me that like I had to like could barely wait for the the uh, for the for the book to download when I was going just from book to book to book to find out what happened next. <laughs> so I that's the qual it's it's not a satisfying ending, but it's an ending that made me need to read more. So it was a good ending. 